All right. All right, everyone. So, uh, as it was said, I'm Pedro Gomez, founder of WallConnect, and I'll be talking to you about reinventing login with Sign with Ethereum. And I hope that I succeed at doing some live coding as well. So, to kind of like start off, I think I wanted to kind of give a little bit of breaking down the lingo because there's like a lot of talk about like Sign with Ethereum, but at the end of the day, when you think about like what changed with Web3, we had this experience with login and then we switched to Connect Wallet. And all of this terminology is just like kind of reinventing the wheel, but at the end of the day, you have to think about authentication as simply verifying who you are. And if you're a user, you just want, let me in, I don't want to be doing all of this work. And if you think about authentication, it's not fun for them. And less clicks is more, so we need to still kind of bring a new internet, but then also make it very easy for them. So why is Web3 different? Like the most basic concept of Blockchain introduces the concept of a wallet, but back with Web2, we have this idea of an authentication module that's part of a server, and in order to be more self-sovereign, we basically remove that module and we put it in the hands of the users. Uh, but this obviously introduces some problems, and one of the problems is that we can't actually verify it properly, so a standard was created with Sign with Ethereum, and it looks something like this, which is a very simple text message, but it basically says this website wants to access your account. And this is kind of like similar to Web2, but you know, it just doesn't look as pretty because it's all novel and new, uh, but it ends up having the same goals. So what actually means to be connected? Like, so when you actually log in, it's a little different to when you connect a wallet, because when you, connect your wallet, you're exposing the account and it allows the dApp to read some blockchain data and submit transactions, but it doesn't actually tell you does this user actually own the account. So introducing the sign with the Ethereum message is an extra step, which again, it's a little bit inconvenient for the user, but at least it gives guarantees that, you know, not connecting your wallet with someone else's wallet and you're actually the owner of this wallet because you can sign a message. So how does C Sign with Ethereum actually work? Basically, there's a lot of more complicated stuff in here, and it's like quite a big spec, and it can be quite overwhelming, but like this part for me is like the most important one, and it's the part that like we should all take in consideration, because it basically talks about what is actually strictly required in this message. Instead of everyone doing their message the same way, we just need to comply that it has like these seven parameters, like a domain, of the website, an address, a URI, a version, a chain ID to say for which chain you're actually signing into, announced, and an issue at timestamp that tells you when the actual message was signed. But one big difference that we need to consider is the URI versus the domain, uh, because if you don't know, like, you have this like URI, but the domain that you want is actually just a host. And that's what you actually see here if you go here into the message, you actually say, example.com, you don't say the whole URI, because the URI is on the bottom and says, for example, slash login. So that's an important decision to take into account, and we'll see how that's actually going to play out very well in the future. And then you also have like some nonces, and the nonces are kind of complicated, because obviously you can't just generate the nonce uh, locally, you actually have to have some form of like source of truth for the nonce and this nonce has to expire. So some technologies that we can use today that are open source is, for example, Next Off, uh, which is a JavaScript library that it's useful, for example, for Next.js that allows you to have like authentication and will do generation of nonces for you. But is there an easier solution? Yes. So Wallet Connect builds this very interesting library called Web3 Modal that allows you to actually have this experience of connecting your wallet and signing with Ethereum. So uh, you can check out the docs. So if you want to like use it for your hackathon, like that's a useful resource because it gives you like the connect experience. But let's do some actual coding now. Uh, I built the library, um, a project that we're going to try to do a private image upload powered by Sino Ethereum and see how powerful it can be. And if you want to follow it, you can scan this QR code where I've broken down in steps so that you have like different branches that you can follow the code base. All right, let's get to the scary part. <laughs> so 
So the first thing to consider when you you start with this project is that you have to actually follow the instructions of actually getting set up. Uh, there's templates out there, but like I think that one of my favorite ways to get started with the project is with Next.js, and it also gives you the ability to uh, take advantage of Next.off, because if you do it with React, uh, everything is going to be done client side, and then if you actually want to have an authentication server, you're going to have to build that like separately. And if you are not familiar with Next.js, everything is server rendered, and at the same time, you actually have like these serverless functions that actually give you the ability to actually take advantage of the server that's actually rendering the website, and that way you can actually build the next of uh, authentication. So in here, we have the, the first step of the code base, uh, and basically what I've done here is I followed the simple instructions of the, of the documentation, and Right up bat, you, what you have is like a simple application that just like has a connect button. So if I go and render this, um, you will see that Next.js will set up a local environment at localhost 3000, and we should see now just a simple connect button. And that gives you like a little bit of the basis to what you're actually going to need for this project. And from there, you can actually connect your wallet, but you still can't sign with Ethereum. Because as you sa saw before, the basic interaction is that you just connect a wallet, which exposes an account, and you actually want to verify that the user owns that account. So if I take that button that is provided by the Web3 model library, He gave me uh, my ENS name, and he has like some ETH, and this is basically the basic experience of an SDK. But nothing guarantees here that I actually own this account. You can actually have like what you call watch addresses, which are basically just tracking a bunch of addresses in your wallet, and in they're injecting that into the application, but it doesn't actually tell you how to actually do that. So in this step, what we've done is installed the library, and we have like some WAGMI configuration. The reason we use WAGMI here is because if you're building a React application, you have to do a lot of state management. So we provide like some e-first configs as well, but the disadvantage of that is that then you have to like do a lot of state management around like is the account connected, is the chain connected. So if you use the WAGMI library with the UI from Web3 Model, you actually have this advantage where you can actually wrap your whole application to have context. And that's what's actually doing here. So you see here that we actually have configured WAGMI with Web3 Modal. And one of the steps that's important is that you actually have to get the project ID uh, at our cloud.wallconnect.com. And then you actually go into the context provider. And this is actually what makes your application like very stateful. Because when you go here, I can refresh, and I'm still connected. See? Like, if you were to do this yourself, it would be a little bit much harder. So with a context, context provider, no matter how many times I refresh, like, the state is preserved, and I'm always connected. But that still doesn't give us, like, what we actually want. So when we actually go here, there's another hooks that we can do. But we actually want to do the CWI way. So this is where the next off stuff comes up, right? So next off is a complete open source uh, authentication solution uh, for Next.js applications. So what you actually need to do here is actually go into the Web3 model, CUE, and next off, and you start actually configuring your client. So if I, you can follow these steps also in the GitHub library, where we did the first step of installing Web3 model, and in the second step, we actually have how you actually configure CUE. And one of the most important parts of this is actually this configuration here, where you can actually see how CUE is working. So this actually configures the message parameters for you, but there's certain things that obviously we can't just guess. Uh, so we basically have here some hooks that are also documented in our docs, uh, but basically it creates a message, and that message is formatted with the address. Because that part is very important. Like, once you connect the wallet, you get the address, and that needs to be part of the message. It's a requirement, as we saw from the fields of the spec. 
but then you also need the domain and the URI and the chain ID. So in order to get those, what you can do is get with window.location.host. Because obviously, like, yes, you could potentially just like hard code them, but one of the disadvantages of that is that if you're in localhost, then you don't actually have the same uh, domain as if you're like in production. And then wallets will actually verify that they're actually on localhost and say this is a malicious message because it's actually pretending to be in another website. So it's much better to not hard code these things and to just read it directly from location. And then once you actually have all those message parameters, the most important part is actually the nonce. And the reason we actually don't put the nonce within the other message parameters, it's because this is more dynamic and we actually need the next off system to actually uh, take care of that. Uh, and that's why we actually have to use next off. It's the most important part. And NextOff provides us with like some really nice hooks here for signing in and getting the session and getting the token. And we can basically just do that wrapper. If you want to integrate this into your project, you can just go into the steps that we're following here and you will see here how you can actually configure this. And honestly, like it's a hackathon. Like you just copy this like straight away to get it started. So let's see how that actually changed our application. We go back to localhost. Oh well, uh, I actually need to disconnect so we can actually see how it works. So I connect the wallet, go to MetaMask, and then I can see here that I have account one. And now you see this is the step that I was talking about. Like before we just connected straight away, and now we are getting a pop-up that says, hey, sign this message to prove you own this wallet. So now you actually press sign, and you actually get the message that we actually saw before. I'm gonna make it this bigger so we can actually see. Like we have the message, please sign with your account, which we actually configured uh, here. So you can actually choose a statement. The statement is optional, but it gives a little bit more, you know, personal touch because maybe you wanna put something boring like terms and conditions, or you can say something more personal that actually relates to your application. So that way the user feels a little bit more like this message makes sense. I'm actually connecting to this particular application. And then you actually see the other parameters that we talked about, the issue that, the chain ID, the version, the URI, the URI which matches local host 3000 because we're actually getting it from the window.location and the nonce. And this is the part that like it would be really hard for you guys to actually do this. So it's much better to delegate that to next off and next off does that. So once we actually press sign in, uh, we actually have this uh, connected and verified. But obviously like this is no fun because you know, we're just like looking at the connection process over and over again. So let's disconnect and actually take the next steps. So the next step is actually adding a session provider. And the session provider here, um, the reason we need it is because, as I mentioned before, we actually have a server-side rendered application. So this is different from what you would have with the client-side application like React, because obviously all the state lives in the actual uh, browser, right? So you could just like store that the user is connected in local storage, and you would be done with it. But Obviously, if NextOff is actually handling the authentication and it's handling the nonces, the server is actually the source of truth for whether or not this user is connected. So this actually requires a little bit more steps here. And this part, we actually don't have it um, in our docs because we actually have to go into NextOff. And that's probably the, the hardest part here is actually maybe you have to learn with NextOff. But that's why I also wanted to provide this example so that we actually can view it in practice. And what we actually add here is a special context, which is honestly, it's not that hard, but like it can be sometimes a little, you know, sometimes we're used to just like calling use session. Like for example here, this is what we're doing here, right? We have a, a React hooks use session. And if you read the docs of next off, that's the first thing you're gonna do. You're gonna be like, oh, I wanna use the session that was created. Like, let me just get that right away. And it's gonna throw you an error. And what you actually need to do is actually go into your layout. And the same way we put the Web3 model provider to give context, we also need to have the session provider. And it's quite simple because you can just import it from next off. And you just need to make sure that you actually pass the children so you can wrap it. Uh, but after you're doing that, like everything within the layout will have access to the session. So now in the page, uh, what I did here, uh, just because you know I wanted us to visualize much better, I just like stringified it the session, 
and what you will see here is actually literally just JSON. And you will see the payload that Nextoff provides you, which has no data, uh, because obviously if you have no session, there's no data there. And, but it does have a status, which is really useful if you have, want to make like loading uh, uh, scenarios or you want to kind of like put the user a little bit more aware that something is happening. And you can actually see this in action now. Um, so if I go here into MetaMask, um, I connect my wallet. And actually, I wanted to to show this part here. Um, I had to like zoom out a little bit because I wanted you to notice how the difference between like just connecting your wallet and actually signing in with Ethereum changes things. Because on the top, you can actually see that Web3 Model already detected the address to be connected, but we are still in the step of signing in. And here on the bottom, you can see that the status of unauthenticated is still there. So even though you're connected, you're not authenticated. So next off is waiting for that message because that message is the important part. So once we actually sign, we have sign in with Ethereum again, and you can see here, ta-da, this is the important part. Now you actually have a user that's really authenticated and you have guarantees that it actually owns this address, and this data lives server side, so now you can actually do something interesting with it. But in here, we're basically just feeding in that information uh, using the context provider for session provider, and then it's actually rendering in the actual client side. So now we both have the wallet connected, and we have guarantees that this user is authenticated with this address on this chain ID, and it will expire on this date. And this status then allows you to actually build the application so that you can have like loading indicators. So I guess this is time for us to actually build the front end. Uh, so in here, uh, I'm going to go into the next step. So in this step, I added some UI components. And now we're actually going to start it with like, the actual private image upload. So just to keep us like, still like, aware of what the session is doing, there's a tab for that. On one of the tabs, we're actually going to have a way to upload an image, and on the other tab, we're going to have like the image gallery that you have. Um, in the session, you can see it's still authenticated, and here you can see you, I can upload. But you know, these are just UI components. So even if I go, I don't know, pick some random thing here and upload, you can see the console log. There's nothing happening because we just created some UI components. So how are we actually going to upload these images? Um, we need to store them somewhere. Like, this part is highly opinionated. So at this point, I just had to pick something. Um, and some people might like SQL or MongoDB. Some people might want to do it on IPFS. But I wanted to make sure that this is as easy as possible. And since we're already building on Next.js, uh, Next.js is built by the same team that built Versal. And in, you can deploy your Next.js application on Versal. And they allow you actually to store images very easily with something called Versal Blob. So we're going to use Versal Blob to actually uh, add the images. And the way it works is you can see here in the components, I have the upload file. And it adds like some library here, um, Versal Blob, that has a put method. And what we're going to do is actually take uh, the session that we had before. And we have the an address and a chain ID. So we're going to actually take the form that we saw before to upload an image. And we're going to uh, encode it uh, to get an account. And in here, we actually use a standard called CAIP10. And you might think, what's a CAIP? Uh, the same way you have EA EIPs, interim improvement proposals, you also have CAIPs, which are chain agnostic improvement proposals. And this allows you to actually say that this is going to be an Ethereum based chain with a chain ID, for example, one, and then follow one address. It's just a way of encoding uh, data in a way that you have a chain agnostic. So if you wanted to support even non Ethereum chains, uh, this would be always compatible. And the reason we do this is because we want to make sure that RM images are being stored like uniquely. So you basically take the account as a prefix and then a file name, and then we're actually going to put those images into the profile. So Let's disconnect here because, once again, let's sign in with Ethereum. Uh, make sure that I want to switch this account because it's getting annoying. All right. So we go back to the session. Okay. 
No, it's actually loading. So we're unauthenticated. We connect our wallet. It always requires this to sign because we want to make sure that this user actually owns. Now we're authenticated. Now I can actually go upload, choose a file, choose this random screenshot I took years ago, and it's uploaded. Um, if this was a good application, it would actually tell you I didn't need to look at the CLI. But then once we go to images, uh, Versal Blob is actually going to show us that I actually already loaded the image. Oh, you can even see like some previous images that I uploaded before. So why would this be interesting? Like we're saying that we're reinventing login with Sino with Ethereum. Why would this be interesting? Because obviously it's really good to have like everything with like global consensus and stored on chain, but then you don't have access to creating like private stores. So with this system, what we're actually doing is that, for example, if I disconnect here and I refresh, because this is a very hacky application that you have to refresh, uh, and now I change to account two, for example, uh, I'm going to connect my wallet. And obviously, I don't want the account two to actually see the images that I have stored with account one. So I actually am verifying here that this is a truly account two, because if I didn't have sign in with Ethereum, I could just inject the address and pretend that I'm account one. But now you see that inside images, there's nothing here. So I have a session authenticated with a different address. So I go to images and it doesn't show anything. Well, it shows here because I always use the same, but it doesn't show the other two images. Remember, there were like three images. So now I'm going to try to upload different images. So it's like, like, for example, wow, why do I have that? Like that's <laughs> like I don't know. Let's let's upload that. That was super random. Like <laughs> we uploaded Trump uh, in there. Um, let me see if it, that uploaded. Did I not click upload? This guy. I have to delete my screenshots. Like that's so old. All right. Let's check. Upload 200. Yay. And now I go to images and it loads. Okay, so now I have this like top secret like tweet that I don't want anyone to see because one day I want, uh, when Donald Trump runs again, I want to show him this tweet, but I don't want the account one to see it. So now if I go back, refresh the website, uh, connect the wallet, but now we're actually going to connect, um, well, let's connect with three. So it's empty. We sign with Ethereum. We verified that it's actually account three, and now I don't have any images, no, no tweets from Trump or anything, like no image of like that gift card uh, that I had there. So yeah, so this gives us the power now to actually have verification that this user owns. I don't need Google, I don't need email, like I just need your wallet to actually have like uh, some data stored. And in this case, because I wanted to make sure that we prototype something quick, I use like Versal Blob, but you could store this on Rweave or IPFS. I just want to make sure that, you know, there's only a couple of hours you guys have to build a project. Uh, I want to make sure that you guys get it like super quick and really feel the power that Sinem Ethereum gives you. But that kind of doesn't feel like we're reinventing login. So let's talk a little bit more about what's next for Sinem Ethereum. Like that was like the most basic form of authentication where we basically just verified that you are who you are. But one thing that was really annoying with that was that every time you had to click twice to go into a website, like even like normal Google login, you only have to click once. So at WallConnect, we created a standard called CAIP222, which is also chain agnostic because we didn't want this to just be Ethereum specific, to be like for every blockchain. And what we did was, if we always have to connect and sign, but sign already gives you the authentication, why do you even need to connect? Why not just skip straight to signing? So we did this and basically we made that signing with Ethereum was authentication. And this is something that we're working together with wallets because obviously it's a big shift towards the existing experience, but eventually you will start seeing wallets actually just signing with Ethereum right up front and skipping the whole connecting stage. But while we did do less clicks is more, I think we could do even less clicks. Well, how we can do better? Uh, there's this standard that was also created by the same team that built Sinew Ethereum called Sinew Ethereum Capabilities. 
uh, also known as recaps. And the reason it's called recaps is because in Sign of Ethereum we have this thing called resources. So this is a Sign of Ethereum message. And now we have like this big blob of text that it is a recap. And what recap does is actually create to you a very special statement. And in this statement it says, not only I want to sign in with Ethereum with this account at example.com, but I also want to further authorize that the stated URI can perform the following actions. And now this is interesting because now you see that the URI is no longer example.com.login. Because one thing that signing with Ethereum is a little bit ambiguous is that the URI actually does not need to match the domain. The most important thing is that the domain matches the request that's coming from the website, but the URI can essentially tell you what is the target of this authorization. So in the past, we were like looking at example.com slash login because we wanted to authenticate the user for the login page. But what we can do is even more powerful than that is actually give a special key some powers to act on the behalf of the account. So in this recap, we're actually saying that this DID key, and a DID key is just like a DID way of representing a key, but at the end of the day, it's just a public key. It's just a public key and a very special encoding. But we have this public key actually acting on the behalf of the Ethereum account with the power to delete and update pictures from example.com slash pictures, and even having the power to message and send and receive messages to a certain email. And that's really powerful because, you know, we can actually have a very secure way to actually not have to use your wallet. One of the disadvantages of wallets is that you always have to go to a special application called the wallet, and there's like this back and forth that it's not very nice. So if we already skipped two steps with uh, the CIP222 wallet authenticate to not do connect and sign, could we skip further steps to not having to sign further messages? But then again, that brings us to the problem of is this key secure? Because we just gave the DAP some key. Maybe we don't need to do uh, that in the key. We can approve everything from the DAP, but still make it secure through pass keys. So pass keys is becoming more and more popular. And you might have seen these like looking like this. Uh, whether it's on iPhone or Android, doesn't matter. Like pass keys exist in your device where they're secured in the enclave and websites can leverage them to actually use it for different purposes. So now that we actually have used Sinoe Ethereum recaps, we can give a passkey the capability to act on the behalf of an Ethereum account. And now you can have signed authorizations that actually manage private data or even in the future, we can even manage transactions on chain with smart accounts. But basically this is the goal of like Wallet Connect and the Sign in with Ethereum community and the IDs to redefine the wallet experience. And at the end of the day, I hope that we can focus on building a better experience for people so that we can onboard more people to own their data. And with less clicks is more, I think that's the way we're gonna get people excited about owning their identity and data. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Uh, question about the signing of the nonce and you know the entire thing. Uh, how uh, how much potential is there to abuse this for a malicious app to actually make you sign something that you didn't mean to? Um, you're talking about the actual nonce here. The thing that is sent to your That, that's a good question. So actually there's some history around this um, where some people might have not know, but we actually moved away from uh, if sign to personal sign. And the reason for that, and I can't find the actual source, but I'll just put this in the screen, uh, is that if sign was actually raw signing. So that meant that we're actually telling users to actually sign anything, and it could be either a transaction or a message. And then we moved to personal sign, and personal sign was signing something that was just pure text, and it could never emulate a transaction. And that was already a big step, and pretty much, I don't think any wallet today 
Uh, well, some wallets have like a special advanced setting that you can enable if signing, but most of them is disabled by default because you should never do if sign because it's very dangerous. So now it's very safe to say that it's we can sign with personal sign. But what is, is even is better about signing with Ethereum is that you're not just signing any message, you're signing a very structured message. And if I were to sign another message, actually, let me get you another example. Uh, connect. All right, so in here, I'm actually signing a message that is not signed with Ethereum. And you see the difference here? It's just plain text. And before we actually had like actual parameters, the reason MetaMask is able to do that in the other message is because we created strict rules with the sign with Ethereum where we can actually validate the message text that's inside. So we went from like raw signing to text message signing, and then from text message signing to structured text message signing. So in the past, people were like verifying their ownership by literally saying, hello, Web3 model. Like it was like stupid stuff like that. And now we have sign with Ethereum, so we can actually have like actual like OAuth capabilities built into a sign with Ethereum message. So it's much, much better, it's much, much safer. And it's thanks to that that we actually were able to create the CAIP222 where if we have such a structured message for sign with Ethereum, we don't even need to create the connection at the beginning. We can just skip to the structured message and actually encode the connection as a resource. And that's what's so powerful about Sign with Ethereum because that standardization of the message is much better than hello Web3 model. And uh, do things like uh, the Ledger hardware wallet actually support displaying the message or that's in the future? Um, actually, I've never tried that actually. Um, if someone has a, I don't have it. No, I don't. I left it at home which is a good security to never bring it. Uh, but like, it, I will go home and try it. Uh, but I would hope so, like, because this standard, I can't remember, you can always search standards. Um, how old is this? 2021. If Ledger hasn't supported that, yikes. But you know, like, it's it's pretty stable standard now, like it's being used very widely and I think it's like one of the most powerful things because a lot of the on-chain data that we have gives us a lot of capabilities, but then we have to connect to the rest of the world, you know? There's like a lot of things that are in, sitting in databases that we need to like link it to the on-chain world. And I feel like this, is, this was the missing piece. And we need to, this opens up so many projects that we can build that are the perfect merge between off-chain and on-chain. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the patience. Yeah, thank you.